This week, we have three SSGC activities. Today, our weekly King's Kit for 3 to 12 years old will resume at 11.30 a.m. Later at 3.30 p.m., Ladies Connections will meet. And for Thursday, Pastor Lee Chu from SIBKL will share with us on how to spiritually protect our church through prayer. Details of the events will be provided at the end of the service. We now welcome our speaker, Wai An, to deliver God's message. He is a gifted speaker, a teacher and discipler, used by God in the healing ministry in Europe and Asia. He will be speaking to us on worship expressed in witness and warfare. Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we meet virtually this morning, let us consider what James said in chapter 1, verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many times. And I don't understand, James, what do you mean pure joy? We, not only us, but the whole world is facing trials of many kinds. We've all lost one year of our lives doing nothing. Went by so fast. And many of us, we are cooped up in our homes with our families, especially the children, and we are facing tremendous stress from being confined in a small space. And some of us are going through financial difficulties. Some have lost their jobs. There are those who are depressed and they are actually getting, you know, feeling suicidal, some of them, and even some have committed suicide during this difficult time. The world has changed. And yes, we need to change. But what do you mean, James? We have to consider it pure joy. There's a major change in my thinking and my attitude. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, and because, ah, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And of course, we know that perseverance means it's easy. That's why we persevere. No, it's not. It's because it's difficult. That's why we persevere. And so, the testing of our faith produces perseverance under trials of many kinds. And that perseverance will finish its work. You mean the perseverance has to go on because the trials are going to go on? Yes. Why? So that you may be mature as a believer. So that you may become complete as a Christian, not lacking anything. But why? I don't understand. And I don't even know how to get along doing all these things. And then James gives you another piece of advice. He says, verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom to know, then you should go to God and ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to you. So Lord Jesus, as the world has changed and as we also have to change, and you have told us to consider it your joy. Lord Jesus, we will rejoice because we are facing trials of many kinds. And whenever we face any trials, God, thank you that the testing of our faith produces that perseverance. And that perseverance will finish God in my life, in our life, so that we may be mature as Christians, complete as Christians, not lacking anything. And God, should I like the wisdom to know your will? God, please give it to me so that I know your will. I know how to move forward and change because this is a period, a time of change, not just for us, but for the entire world. And I, as a believer, I wish to persevere and to change so that I can be complete. So give me your wisdom, God, as we Look at your words together because we are in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, we're looking again at worship as the theme. And this time, we're looking at worship as a lifestyle that's expressed, that comes out in our witness and in warfare. So we're looking at three words. Worship, what it is, and why that should make us into witnesses, 
and how we do warfare with the worship as the foundation. So we need to examine what is Christian worship. So we start at the beginning that we have tried to reach God as sinful men. We try using religion, we try using relationships, we try with good words, we try with giving money, we try with prayer, we try even with going to church. And we must realize that in Romans 3, 23, it says that we all have sinned, all of us, no exception, and we all saw the glory of God. So no matter what we do, we cannot get to God through all these things, religion, relationships, going to church, praying, we cannot get to God. And what we could not do, we tried to get to God and we could not succeed, God turned it around. God changed the whole thing. And he came to us to take because we cannot reach that holy God. All has always shot. Always shot. And so he came born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered and he died on the cross. And he was buried, rose again on the third day. And because of what he has done, for all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God. And because of what he, Jesus, has done, in him we have redemption through his blood. And redemption means an exchange, you know, a coupon for a gift or a redemption of his blood for the forgiveness of our sin. And that is not because of us, it's in accordance with the riches of God's grace. So God's grace, he reached to us, not we reach to him. What a Savior, what a God, a God of God indeed. And in Hebrews, we learn that in fact, the law requires that nearly everything to be cleansed with blood and without that shedding of blood, that is no forgiveness. And so we realize that, wow, this God not only came, he gave his blood in redemption, in a change for us receiving forgiveness of our sins. What we could not do through our own efforts, God did by coming down to us. And so we love him because he loved us first. That's why we love him. And that's why we worship him. Because he loved us first. And not only that, Romans, Paul tells us, tells the Romans that God demonstrates his own love for God. In that while we were still in our sinful state, while we were still not interested, while we were still sinning, God, through Jesus Christ, died for us. So because of that, what can we give God in return? We love Him because He first loved us. We worship Him because He deserves all our worship, all our adoration, all our praise. We worship because he loved us first. That's why we love him and we worship him. And the next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming to him. And John said, Behold, this is the Lamb of God. He takes away the sin of the world. The perfect Lamb of God. He gave his blood, the perfect Lamb of God, so that we can have forgiveness. And that is the reason why we worship God. And because we worship Him, we adore Him. Because of what He has done, because of that, how does that affect me as I go forward in a lifestyle, in, a, in my actions, in everything I do in terms of witness and in terms of warfare? So let's look at witness. And we need to know that we define witness as a person who sees an event, typically a crime or an accident takes place. And a witness, witness means to show that something exists or is true. And another definition of witness is that we to have knowledge of something that happened from our observation or from our observation. And so we know that a person needs to be present at a transaction, 
So that we are able to say, yes, I'm able to testify that this actually has taken place. And then finally, to be a sign or proof of something that has happened. I'm a witness that something has happened. So what we need to understand is that there is a before. My before all these things happen, what happened? Then you ring. That's what a witness has to do. This actually happened. You ring. And then this and this and this. And then the word. What was the result of the word? So for Christian witness, we need to know before I became a Christian. My life was okay. I was just doing okay with my life. Oh, my life was wonderful. I was so happy. I was well off. I had good health. Or before I got to know Jesus. I had depression, physical illnesses, whatever it is, it was before. And then during my encounter with Jesus, and what happened? How did I meet Jesus in a very personal way? How did our interaction happen during that time? Something happened, it could be a period of time. And then, most important, after, after that, what happened to me? And that is our Christian witness. Especially the afterwards, the results of meeting Jesus because your life has changed. So, what we need to look at now, let's look at witness and how it relates to the Lordship of Jesus. So, this is all of us. We are running our own life and we are on the throne of our own life. And Jesus is outside our lives. And that is a person before they got to know Jesus. So before I got to know Jesus, this is my life. I'm running my own life. Whether it's good, it's okay, or it's terrible, I'm in charge. And Jesus is outside my life. And then, what happens during? Jesus is in. Jesus is the Lord now. But I am still the Lord of my own life. I'm sitting on the throne of my life. And slowly, 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 the word, as we go on with Jesus, we realize that, yes, we need to make Jesus Lord. Yes, Jesus is the Lord, but now Jesus is the Lord in my life. I have gone off the throne and I've allowed God to be in charge. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Revelation 3 is talking to one of the seven churches. And in Revelation 3.20, Jesus is saying this. I, Jesus, am standing at the door. And he's talking to Christians. I stand at the door and I knock. And if you open the door, you allow me to be the Lord. Remember, he's talking to Christians, not non-Christians. If you open the door and you let me in. I will have fellowship with you and you with me. This is the right way that we can I will lead you and I will walk with you through all the events in your life. And that is what we mean by my lordship in my life. So let's have a look at two different types of witnesses and let's have a look and see witness A. Witness A started off like all of us, with Jesus outside his life. And then, witness A has Jesus as the Lord of his life, but he is still the Lord of his life. I remember jumping into a taxi, and I said to the taxi driver, can you take me to this church? Very far away, but I need to pick up my friends from the church premises, and then we are going to a final destination together. So as we drove off, I started talking to a taxi driver and I asked him questions about his life and he told me about how he worshipped at a temple and asking other questions about his faith, about his beliefs, and who he believed in or what he believed in. And we were talking and really got together very well. We got on very well. And as we got near the church, he suddenly turned to me and he said, Listen, when I pick up your Christian friends from the church, I'm going to keep my mouth shut and I'm no longer going to talk. So I asked him, why? He said, because whenever the Christians get into my taxi, they'll talk and talk and talk. And they'll be very aggressive. 
and they won't let me talk. They'll just keep shooting at me. They'll keep telling me about Jesus. They keep pushing their opinion on me. So I have learned over many years of having Christians in my car that I will keep quiet when they come into my taxi. So I asked him an honest question. But excuse me, I am also a Christian. And very sadly, I heard. He turned to me and he said, you are different. Why am I different? All these Christians go into his car, into his taxi, and they are not interested in him. They are more interested in pushing Jesus as the Lord. But they are not interested in the person. Would Jesus have done the same? Would Jesus have just talked and talked and talked? Or would Jesus have been interested in the taxi driver? life. I will shut up when we meet a Christian. Are you one of those? Are you witness number one? Witness A. Now, I have friends, Jackie and Peter. They are not Christians, but they are my friends. And they know I'm a Christian. And they told me that they organize annual Christmas events. A very large non-Christian organization. Maybe thousands of every year. And he said, we have a problem because we invite different churches every year to do something to tell us what the Christians do at Christmas. That we learn, we hear, and we participate in what they do. But Jackie and Peter told me, the problem is, the pastors, they would talk a very long time and then they sing songs that we don't understand, that we don't understand how it relates to Christmas. So what we need to do is we need to understand that these people who are not Christians, large numbers of them, they want to know why is Christmas so important to us? Why do you say that it's so important? Because Jesus came, born of a Virgin Mary. And what is the significance of that? Why are the years 2001 in the year of our Lord 2021? Why it's even the years, why are even the years named after him? And yet, understand what the pastor is trying to do. They are trying to show that Jesus is the Lord. But are they allowing Jesus to show them that Jesus is the Lord in their life and the way they behave? When they preach and evangelistic, yes, I understand what they're trying to do. Evangelistic sermons going on and on and on. Evangelistic songs that have not much to do with Christmas. Is that what Jesus would have done? Because Jesus is the Lord in these people's lives, in the lives of the leaders of these churches, but they are still the Lord of their life, still the Lord of their church. And Matama Gandhi, in an apocryphal story, apparently he said, I like your Christ, I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so like Christ. It's apocryphal because we can't prove it's true. It may or may not be true. And I don't think this is true because, yes, we should like our Jesus Christ. But when you say you don't like your Christians, well, yeah, these are Christians, but Jesus is a Lord, but they are the Lord of their own life. These are Christians, but they are not good witnesses. I'm sorry, Christians are not like that. Real Christians who have Jesus as the Lord of their life are not like that. We, Christians, we are like our Jesus Christ because we allow Jesus Christ to be the Lord over our life. So let's have a look at witness B. And witness B is where Jesus is the Lord and I'm still the Lord of my own life because I have just been introduced to Jesus. But over the period of weeks, months, years even, I'm slowly trying ever upwards, self pure. And slowly, slowly, I'm saying, Jesus, I open the door to every room in my life. And yes, this room is dirty. I try to clean it up as a Christian. It didn't work. So Jesus, I open the door. You come in and you help me clean up this room of my sexual immorality. This room of my gossip. This room where I tried as a Christian. It didn't work. I open the door. Jesus, come in help me clear out the rubbish, the envy, the Try anger in this room, and you be the Lord, and please help me to clear these rooms because I make you 
Jesus as the Lord in my life. And the Holy Spirit will show us. Because 1 Corinthians 2 tells us the sense. For to us, God has revealed all these things through God's Spirit. For the Spirit of God searches all things. And the Spirit of God is inside God. So the Spirit of God searches all things even inside the depths of God. And who among men, giving you an example, you think that among men, who knows the talk of men? But the spirit of a man is inside the man, and the spirit of the man knows the talk of man in the same way. Who knows the talk of God? Spirit of God, who is inside God, knows the talk of God. And then he comes to a very interesting, very amazing revelation, and that is. Verse 12. For now we receive not the spirit of the world, but we receive God's spirit. The spirit is from God. And if the spirit of God who goes inside God and knows the thoughts of God, and that spirit of God goes inside me with the Lordship of Jesus Christ goes inside me and He is inside me, then that spirit of God will reveal to us so that we will know the things really given by God. So, to summarize, if we have Jesus Christ in our lives, and if Jesus is the Lord over our lives, and we move under the anointing of the Spirit of God, then the Spirit of God knows the thoughts of God, and the Spirit of God can bring the thoughts of God to our lives and move us forward. Representing Jesus, representing God, moving forward with the power of the Holy Spirit. Because that spirit inside us is not from the world, it is God's spirit. And that will allow us to know freely all the things given to us by God. So let me tell you about this church in London, in Nottingham, uh, not Nottingham Gate. And I was waiting outside. Uh, the door, the big doors of this church, because uh, it was a two o'clock service and I was waiting for it to finish so that I could go off and meet my friends and go off for social. For social. And what happened was uh, this young man outside the church, he came to me and said, look, I've got a cigarette. I've got a light for my cigarette. He said, I'm sorry, smoke. And he went up to the lady who was smoking, got a light, and two of them sat down outside the church. And I went up to them and I started talking to them. And then the young man said to me, I'm not a Christian. I'm also meeting my friends from the church. But I'm not a Christian. I said, why not? And he told me, I not follow Jesus. So I asked him, is it that you cannot? Or you will not? And he said, I cannot. So I asked him to explain. And he told me a little bit more. And I said to him, kneel down here outside the church, on the pavement, and I will pray with you, and I will lead you in prayer. And he knelt down with me, and he kept praying outside the church. And we were praying, and of course, the woman who was smoking looked at us, and I still remember, she said, Oh God, and she walked away. But we prayed. And then, after we finished praying, the doors of the church opened, and people were coming out. And I still remember, jumped up, he ran into the church shouting, I'm a Christian now, I'm a Christian now. He started shouting as he ran into the church. And of course, I quietly left. I don't want to have anything to do with 90 people like that. But I can understand his excitement here. Cannot follow Jesus, now he can. It's not that I don't want to. I wish to. Many years ago, I met a different young man and I was introduced to him. And he looked at me very strangely. I've never seen him before. Or so I thought. And he was looking at me, and she got very excited. And then she grabbed hold of my Bible. This is my Bible. She grabbed hold of my Bible, and she flipped through the pages. And then she got even more excited, and he looked for different verses. And then she looked and looked, then he looked at me and said, I know who you are. You told me about Jesus many, many years ago. 
I don't remember your faith, but I remember your Bible. And of course, for all of us in those days, today, of course, I use a computer Bible and uh, on my phone as well. And so, of course, it's not the same. But in those days, of course, our Bibles are written in underlined, you know, the full of personal things. And of course, he remembered the verses and as he went there, he recognized that Bible. So, he did not recognize my faith. He remembered all the things from the Word of God that I shared with him. From the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to witness the people. So, the Holy Spirit whom we have to see, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God. Why? So that we may know the things freely given to us by God. And God has given us the ministry of reconciliation, and we go out and represent God as His ambassadors. That's in First Corinthians, uh, uh, Second Corinthians, uh, five seventeen, and we go forward in the power of the Holy Spirit with Jesus Christ as the Lord in my life, and we, Jesus and Christ together, we can represent God in a fallen, hurting world as His witness of what He has done in my life. I'm a witness who can go out and do wonderful things sharing the reconciliation of blood of Jesus with these people. So we have looked at worship and why we worship because He first loved us. That's why we love Him back. And He gave His blood in exchange, in redemption for the forgiveness of Him. And that's why I love Him and that's why I worship Him. He deserves my worship. He deserves our worship. And that is why I, you, we are witnesses in our everyday life. Not witness A with Jesus as the Lord but not about our life, but as a witness B. Jesus as the Lord and He also as the Lord of my life and moving in the power of the Holy Spirit. Witness. So now let's Look finally at warfare. So, I was in an evangelistic meeting, and after the meeting, I saw again a young man, a different young man, and he, of course, when you look at him, you know he's not a Christian. But I said, Hello. So, I love meeting people like that. So, I'm always on the lookout not to meet with Christians, but with people who are not. Hello. He said, Hello. So, we introduced ourselves, and I asked him, Why are you at this meeting? And he said, I follow a guru, but I am a seeker. So it's great. I love talking to seekers. Are you seeking to find out who Jesus is? And he said, yes. So I said, look, I'm not interested in your guru, but as long as we talk about Jesus, I love talking about Jesus, let's sit down on spend time with you. So we found a quiet honor. I got about four or five of our junior team members to sit with us and so to learn. And he agreed and we talked. And he spoke, and I told him, number one, God loves you, number two, we have all sinned, and he was asking in everything and Jesus as he got along, and when suddenly he started talking and ranting about his guru, yes, talking about his guru, and of course, I recognized what was happening. You do as well, don't you? So, as I continued looking at him, I said, look, whatever is disturbing our conversation, whoever or whatever distractions that are coming from this guru through his mind, through his mouth. You, and I wasn't talking to the young man, I said, you, you stop that. You shut up. And you, get down. Not get out, but get down. Because if this young man is still following this guru. So you get down. I have no authority to get it out. And then, I trust him. When we continue talking about Jesus, in a very quiet, subdued voice, not like the ranting you had just done, he said, okay. So we continued, and very quickly, I concluded our talk and asked him, would you like to make Jesus the Lord of your life? Would you like to invite Jesus into your life? With all your problems, your depression, and all the other things that he told me about, and he said, yes. I said, look, you need to say this. 
I accept you, Jesus, as my Lord, above all the other gods that I have, especially the Guru and every other. So he named them all. And after he finished all that, then he said, all right, I release you from this Guru. You now have a God that above every other God, including this Guru God. So I release you. I cut you off from this Guru. And in the name of Jesus, it wasn't get down now, it was get out of his mind, get out of his physical body, get out of his spirit. And of course, the rest of it is boring for those of you who understand spiritual warfare because then things begin to happen. Very interesting, some even violent things happen and he was that way. So we need to know how to help people to, who are with other gods to look for the God, our God, the God of us all God, the King every other king, we need to be witnesses to help these people. We need to share with these people. We need to do warfare to set these people free from other gods to serve the God of God, the King of Kings. In James chapter 4, verse 7, James tells us, Submit therefore to God, number one. Number two, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So if Jesus is the Lord, but he is not the Lord in charge of your life. Jesus is the Lord, but I am still the Lord of my life. First, you, can, you are not submitted therefore to God, but you can still resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Matthew chapter 7, conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, in the last days, many will come to me. Many will come to him. And they will say, in the name of Jesus, we perform miracles. We prophesy. And we cast out evil spirits. Yeah, we cast out evil spirits in the name of Jesus. And they will flee from me. But Jesus said, I will say to them, depart from me. You may have cast out evil spirits. You may have resisted the devil and he flees from you. But I don't know you. You did it in the name of Jesus. I still don't know you. Because you acknowledge Jesus as the Lord, but you the Lord your own life. So spiritual warfare requires, number one, submission to God. Number two, resist the devil. Not, number two, resist the devil. Finish. And forget about number one. That's not important. Jesus is Lord, but he's not my Lord. That's not important. Let's resist the devil. That is a very dangerous way of doing warfare. So let's have a final look at spiritual warfare in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. Very well known to a lot of those involved in spiritual warfare. And in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, there are three parts. Number one, they, the Christians, they overcame Satan. They overcame Satan because of, number one, the blood of the Lamb. Number two, they overcame Satan because of the word of their testimony, their witness. Number three, 11c, they overcame Satan because they did not love their life, even when they were faced with death. And so, when we look at spiritual warfare, I hear so many people involved in spiritual warfare who talk about the blood, the magic powers of the blood, the powerful uh, understanding of the symbology of blood, but they don't really understand. That's why these people, they are very superstitious. And you hear them saying, oh, I cut out a, a spirit of this, a spirit of Jezebel, a spirit of... Uh, 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 Python, a spirit of everything. Yes, yes, I've also encountered those, but that is not important. And it's nothing to do with their understanding of the blood of Jesus Christ. Because if Jesus is the Lord in your life, but he is not the Lord in charge of your life, you are still in charge on the throne of your own life, then therefore you cannot say that you overcame him because of the blood of man. Blood of the Lamb is God Himself came to us and He died for us. The perfect Lamb of God He gave His blood in exchange, in redemption of His name. It's not a magic word, but the power of knowing what God has done. The blood of the Lamb. And if you have Jesus in your life as Jesus as the Lord, you acknowledge him, and you acknowledge him as the Lord 
over your life, then and only then can you overcome him because the plan, not magic words. And 11b, the word of their testimony. So, let me ask you, what do your relatives think of you as a Christian? What do your friends, non-Christian friends, work colleagues, what do they think of you as a Christian? If I ask them, would they say that you have a good testimony? In fact, why don't I ask your brothers and sisters in the church what they think of you as a Christian? It's, yes, Jesus is the Lord, but is he the Lord of your life? Or are you still running your own life? So your testimony is worthless. You're not the kind of witness that's doing what Jesus is doing. Yes, he has come into your life, but you have not changed. Before, during, but there's no after. There's no aftermath. So you cannot do spiritual warfare because you do not have the word of your testimony, a good testimony. Yes, you have a testimony, but it's a bad testimony. And so when you change, so that when I ask your relatives, I ask your friends, especially those who are not Christians, and I ask especially your Christian brothers and sisters who know you and who love you, but they don't like you. The Bible says we've got to love one another. It doesn't say I've got to like you. I just have to love you. And I don't like you because of the And if you make you the Lord of your life, then you will change. Your testimony will change. And you will be able to do warfare because of the word of your testimony. Good word. And finally, 11 C. And to overcome Satan, you must not love your life, even when faith is dead. So let's have a look at Hebrews 2 to understand about loving your life. Do not love your life even when faith is dead. Hebrews chapter 2, 14 says, Therefore, since we, humans, we, the children, especially the Christians, we share in flesh and blood. Jesus himself also, likewise, he also partook of the same. He also became flesh and blood so that through death, he, Jesus, might render powerless him who has power of death. Who is him? That is the devil. So what he's saying is that we have flesh and blood. Jesus himself took on flesh and blood. And through his death as flesh and blood, he is able to render powerless the devil who has the power of death. But this doesn't apply to us because I know many people who are not set free. Because what Jesus did has set free those who to fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. I know so many Christians who are fearful of death. But what they tell me is, please pray for me, brother. I have cancer. I have this terminal illness. I'm going to die. Please pray for me so that I can be healed. And I said, why should you be healed? Because I believe God will heal. But what happens if God doesn't heal you? Oh, no, no, don't say that. Don't say that. God must heal me. I must be healed. I said, why? What happens if God doesn't heal you? I don't want to talk about that. Go away. I'm not going to ask you to pray for me. But are you ready to die? No, I'm not. When they are honest, not all, some, and we are talking about Christians, they say, I'm not ready to die. I have a fear. We're talking about Christians here. Those who have a fear of that, they were subject to slavery all their life. So you, in spiritual warfare, you, did, to overcome Satan, you must not love your life. Even when faith is there. But there are many Christians who have fear. They pray for miracles. This is a message I received from someone last year about their, the person they love who has a stroke. And he said, for my family, we have made a joint decision. We all agree. Only one option left. God promised to heal. That's it. So in other words, Jesus is the Lord, but I'm in charge. So God, you only have one option. We come together, we agree. You must heal. And brain friends have reported seeing rainbows. Yeah, yeah. as far as I know, rainbows means I promise there won't be a flood. The next one will be a fire. But what has rainbows got to do with this healing? Tomorrow marks the third, the end of the third day after my loved one stroke. God has already poured out miracle after miracle. So those who are not Christians also see miracles. Yeah? Because of what the doctors treat and God heals. 
And may I request the all pray for Jesus' resurrection power to fill AAA tomorrow, to fill this person tomorrow, and they want this person to jump out of that coma, jump out of bed, and be fully healed. In other words, Jesus is Lord. So we are the Lord. We tell Jesus what to do. And let us dare to believe God's mighty miracles. My family plan to be up by 7.30 for this. Join us at this time if you can. No. Is Jesus the Lord? And do we say that we do not love our lives and our loved ones' lives, even when faced with death? Can we say that because the children, we can flesh and blood, and Jesus himself became flesh and blood, and through his death, he rendered powerless Satan who has the power of death. And that, because of what Jesus has done, he might free those who through fear of death, fear of my relative's death. And we are subject to slavery because Jesus is Lord, but Jesus is not Lord in our lives. We are the ones to tell Jesus what to do, what he must do to heal. He, we, you must heal Jesus. Is that making Jesus Lord of our lives? Does it mean we will never ever die? We'll never fall sick? We'll never die in accident? Because we are fearful of death. There's some of you here. So in conclusion, worship. We worship God because we try to reach God, but God came to us. He loved us first. That's why we love Him. That's why we worship Him. His blood shed on the cross so that in exchange, I can have the forgiveness of my sin. And so, what do we have to do? We have to walk forward in witness and in warfare. So there are three of types of people here. You, some of you here. Jesus is outside your life. Can you just do this simple thing? This is before you encountered Jesus. Now you're encountering Jesus as I see. Can you open the door, allow Jesus to come into your life so that Jesus is the Lord? And that's only the during. There's an aftermath. The and I would like you to have to open all the different doors in your life. And you, and there are some of you here who've been Christians for many years, you have a fear of death. Jesus is the Lord, yes, but you are still the Lord of your own life. And that's why your testimony is no good. You have a fear of death. And you don't understand what the blood of Jesus has done for you. And you must allow God to take over more and more areas of your life. Allow Jesus not only to be Lord, but to be the Lord of your life. And to those of us who already have Jesus Christ as Lord of my life, let me encourage you, go forward in, as a witness to share the power of the blood, the power of the death, and especially the resurrection of Jesus Christ into this fallen world, into a world that is changing, and we change as well, so that we are able to move forward and together we can bring the good news of Jesus to a fallen world, to our witness, and to our warfare. May this be true. All of us. Amen. Thank you, Uncle Wayan, for the wonderful message. In response to NECF's call for the Christians in Malaysia to come together and to pray and fast for our nation, our elder Eng An will be leading us in prayer for the nation together. I must confess that for a long time, I find it difficult to pray for this country of ours. And I'm forced to go back to the Bible to look at what God has to tell us. Let me read for you the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for of theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, 
for they shall be, they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Let's now pray. And I invite you to kneel down even as we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Lord, we pray. We pray that, Lord, your glory may come upon earth. And, O oh Lord, we pray that nations throughout the world will come to acknowledge that you are God and the Lord of the universe and to you we owe our being and O oh Lord we owe to you our very lives Lord we want to remember your church in this country Malaysia Heavenly Father we pray for your church first your people for you have said that judgment must part with your people, your church. So Lord, we ask for purity in your people. We ask, Heavenly Father, Lord, that we will put away all kind of evils and all kind of things, Lord, that have taken your place in our hearts. And indeed, Lord, we will put you first in our lives. And not only in this church, but, O oh Lord, for every, every person who are called by the name of Christ in this country. Lord, we pray that your people will be humble and will bear humility as our hallmark, as our character even O oh Lord as you interact with one another and with the people outside the church and with our family that they will see Christ in us Lord we pray that you will put compassions in our heart that we will feel compassion and love and forbearance and patience towards people around us, particularly a lot of law people who do not know you and therefore have not come under your goodness and your grace. May you cause us, a Lord, to move our hands and our legs to be compassionate and to bring your blessings and your message of love and grace to them. Give us, a Lord, a sense of pride in the honour of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for the people of this country. Lord, we ask that you remember them in their pain and their losses arising from COVID-19 and in the systemic rape of this country of the national treasury were for such a long time. Lord, we pray for their loved ones, for their family members and their relatives, their friends and their neighbours, 
especially a lot if they have lost them through diseases. Lord, may you, may you, Lord, watch over them and give them unity in heart as units of family to honour you as the father of this universe, Lord. Lord, comfort them, even the Lord, in the losses that they face from financial and economic uh, situations. O oh Lord, we pray that you will restore to them the financial and economic security. We also pray, O oh Lord, for their, their emotional and mental stability. During this time of stress, when the Lord so many things are restricted and they can't move about freely to meet up with one another. Lord, we remember those who are deprived and isolated. May your presence, Lord, be with them so that, Lord, in time to come, they will come to recognize you, who you are, and the Lord will turn to you. Lord, we pray for breadwinners who must necessarily go out to work and expose themselves to the dangers of the disease, watch over them and keep them safe so that, Lord, they will, they will return again to their families with what they need to sustain them. Lord, remember to the many who are compelled to sleep on the streets, even with their little ones, on bare pavements because, Lord, they have suffered financial deprivations. Lord, remember them. May you, Lord, grant them the grace and opportunity to hear your call to them and to search and seek for your Son, Jesus Christ, to find rest and comfort from their burdens. Now, Lord God of heaven and of the earth, how do we pray for our kings and rulers and those in high positions? Lord, your word tells us that you appoint governing authorities to be your servants to do good for the people of the country, to bear the sword of your wrath upon wrongdoers, so as to strike terror in the hearts of the wicked and evildoers. But Heavenly Father, where do we stand? When these very people whom you appointed to execute your judgment have reneged on your mandate upon them, they are your servants, Lord, but they have lost their sense of servanthood. They have forgotten that justice and truth exist and yet behaved and carried on as if you do not exist. Lord, forgive them their sins and their follies. O oh Lord, for the off chance that their souls may be pulled back from the dangers of hellfire, we pray that you will upbraid and rebuke those servants who had done evil instead of good, desecrated your, just, your righteous justice with unholy excesses of greed and indulgences, even when the people of the land are suffering in anguish. That in mercy you will open their eyes to see the errors of their ways and that they will humble their hearts to ask forgiveness from you. That you will establish the works of the leaders who are contrite in heart and submit in reverence to your will 
in both their private and public lives. But at Lord, you will show your disdain and reject the legacy and the heritage of those who refused to acknowledge your will upon them and their families and willfully choose not to submit to you. Lord, close the mouths of those who speak lies and sow discord, who propagate evil and untruths for fame and wealth. Let your words fall like silly ditties upon the ears of the people so that they will not poison our minds with their venom. Lord, raise up leaders, judges, government officers, people in private management, in civil society, and those in high society. Raise up those who are honest, truthful, trustworthy, honourable, courageous, and most of all, who are God fearing in both their private and public lives. Lord, indeed, we pray that your will be done on earth, in this part of this earth, in this land of Malaysia. And grant to us, O Lord, our daily bread, so that, Lord, those who are poor and in need will not be in want. Forgive us, O oh Lord, forgive us our trespasses. For we know, Lord, that we are not without sins. As we forgive those who sin against us, make us your peacemakers on earth, Lord. And help us, Lord, to be your servants, to be your light, in this decaying world, be your salt. Hear this our prayer, Lord, we ask of you, even as we seek your mercy, your grace, your forgiveness, your compassion, and your goodness upon this our land, Malaysia. In the name of your Son, our Lord and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God have mercy on Malaysia. Now, if you are new or have a prayer request or a testimony you would like to share, we would love to hear from you. Please visit the website on the link in the description below. And now in closing, Father Lord in heaven, we thank you for the message that you have given us today and lead us as we learn to live our life to worship you. May your Holy Spirit help us to be alert of our spiritual warfare and may you give us the strength to win the battles in your name. Continue to lead us as well for the upcoming week and in Jesus' name we pray, Amen.